So, Gerard is a senior partner at McKinsey and he leads the digital McKinsey Germany. Over the past 20 years, he has primarily focused on tech enabled transformations in different industries. Most recently, Gerard has been supporting leading automotive and pharma corporations in their digital and analytics transformation, designing new business models, products, and services with digitizing their key process and establishing exciting digital cultures to attract talent for his clients. Prior to joining McKinsey, Gerard was a senior partner at Olive Environment, leading their global technology operations practice. Gerard holds a degree in business administration from Johann, Go Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt and also from Paris 4. And today, he will reflect on how to lead in a disruptive world. So please welcome Gerard. Thank you, Alex. So you made the challenge very hard, right? <laughs> First of all, I'm very honored to uh, be here in front of you to tell a little bit about what's the title, how to lead in a disruptive world. Maybe forget the protocol, I did a little different speech. So, um, but how hard can it be after such inspiring speeches, after an invitation to apply? <laughs> for not a unicorn startup, <laughs> after having drinks in a damn hot room, it's hot outside, after mojito nights, so what should we do? Should we skip this or should we continue? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, have a beer. Well, I hide it, but. <laughs> no, seriously. So, um, Alex, thank you. Um, for the very kind words. So let me start a little bit, and it perfectly fits somehow to the previous speeches, like magic. Um, this whole digital thing, I don't know what you think about, it's a whole confusion, right? If we talk to clients, and by the way, I should tell a little bit about myself, I actually, um, I do two things. First of all, I'm a damn consultant <laughs> for all my life. Second, I have the honor to lead uh, uh, the fifth largest uh, non-for-profit sports club in Bavaria with uh, 1,200 uh, children and youth. And um, thirdly, uh, actually I'm also a philanthropist. I'm investing as a private person, investing into corporate social responsibility companies. So these are the three things I'm doing. Therefore, I very, like, uh, very much like your speech but also the unicorn speech, and I will definitely apply. <laughs> Maybe first to give some figures, some humble figures. In 2017, worldwide at McKinsey, we had 860,000 applications. Um, that's massive, right? And um, we have a, a super action title, which is, we select for skill, but we hire for attitude. So that's exactly what Katrina said. Um, maybe not the worst phrase, and you, should, you shouldn't be stupid, right? But that's clear. No one here in this room is stupid, right? Nobody. However, what distinguishes us is the attitude. Follow your passion to whatever you like. The one is consultant, the other one is the Club of Rome, uh, previous very successful investors. I heard something about uh, tennis courts, swimming pools in your house, so, wow. And the other one actually, <laughs> no right now, but the one, um, the other one, um, so Katrina actually founded a superstar. By the way, um, and in one of our projects, uh, we have your star in our ecosystem. So let me start with this little confusion. Um, let me start with this one. Some of you might know this uh, cartoon. I very much like it because um, many clients, but also startups, and I should mention that uh, we as McKinsey have also undergone or it makes a digital transformation because the consulting job will fundamentally change. With the rise of artificial intelligence, nobody needs maybe 10 years strategic advice because you have the algorithms, you have the access to data and everything to build your own hypothesis, to test them and build the strategies against or with your competitors and build the right ecosystem. So also we have to fundamentally change the way we work. And I don't know whether you're aware of it, uh, as of now, 
At McKinsey, we have more than 3,000 software developers, mathematicians, physicians that actually are doing one thing, helping our clients to build POCs, so uh, proof of concepts, build pilots, and, by the way, work in startups. We have, meanwhile, 12 startup garages uh, over um, in, uh, in uh, three continents, and uh, we are really co collaborating with these startups, and it's real fun. But what you see here is unfortunately, in 80% of the cases, reality. So there are many ideas around. There's many confusion around, but there's no real business value. So hey, let's talk about blockchain. Okay. What do you mean with blockchain? What do you want to do? Ah, I'm not very sure about it. Okay. So, do you understand the technology? No, I heard about it. Ah, okay. I want to invest 100 million. So, okay. So, wait a minute. So what we are going to do with this blockchain? So then we try to elaborate a business case around it, or a philanthropist way, how blockchain can help to uh, increase or balance the distribution of wealth in our society, which is one of the major problems as of today. So um, if you ask me, so personally, that's not a, as a McKinsey person, that is as a Verabichter, as um, in 10 years from now, our world will look completely different. Why? First, that's a no-brainer, compute power. Yeah, it will rise, and um, I don't know whether you're aware, as of today, 1% of the global energy consumption, 1% is consumed by blockchain race. 1%. Just coming back to philanthropists, in times where more than 1.5 billion people worldwide do not have access to energy. Just imagine. So just to give a little bit of thought. So, um, compute power. Second, artificial intelligence based on advanced analytics. And thirdly, if you ask me, cheap money. <coughs> Very cheap money. Everybody actually tries to invest her, her or his or its money into, meanwhile, very inefficient business models. And therefore, we have a misallocation of capital. And as long as we have this cheap money, we will, not in a good sense, but revolutionize this world. Revolutionize, we, um, the connotation for revolution is sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And what we see, especially in society, it's a uh, more or less negative. Therefore, I'm very happy to give some examples today, and please excuse me if I don't mention specific client names, because I learned we are live streaming this on the CDTM Facebook uh, page, so it's hard for me to talk about uh, very confidential topics, uh, because we protect confidentiality, even in times of uh, data insecurity and data in privacy. However, uh, maybe Following this, uh, this session, uh, we have time to exchange some ideas on what we are really doing. So um, let me start a little bit how we think about this whole thing. And I won't bother you with classic consultant slides, don't worry, because um, I also sometimes wonder myself what I would do. Um, <laughs> yes, of course. Because if you're sitting in the team now, in the team room, we have the super motivated team, hey Gerard, we have the best ideas of the world, right? We have the unicorn idea. Well, look, let's have a look at the unicorn idea. And it's on slides, right? So it's on PowerPoint. And um, then let's make it real. And therefore, what we do is we try to really build proof of concepts, right? Um, I don't know whether you are aware, also with our teams, you're aware that we have an, an annual meeting where we invite um, um, startups to apply for the SPAR business. This is an award that actually um, is given by the Handelsblatt and McKinsey to award the most successful startup. Successful not meaning in terms of revenue, in terms of profit, in terms of we saw some numbers, edit is positive in 2017, I, I recall, I think. Um, or in terms of employee growth, in terms of number of clients, no. The overall, the overall 360 view on the startup, especially also the corporate social responsibility topic, is also to review. And um, here what we do is wonderful. Together with these startups, we invite them, and after this competition, we take all 100 startups and work with them. And it's so rewarding to see 
how real life works sometimes and how easy it is and how tough it is to really convince the leaders in the industry, so the top 1,000 fortune companies, to really think that way. Because there are still, if you look at the boards, um, despite the fact there are uh, yeah, too few women, I think, um, but if you look at the boards of the 1,000 uh, Fortune 1000 companies, what's the average age? Yes. Yeah, hmm? So it's uh, 59. Not saying that these people are not educated or understanding what's going on out there. No, not at all. They're super intelligent, super smart, many guys from leading universities, and not saying that professors over 50 are outdated. Um, no, not at all. However, it's, they have difficulties to follow these very, very fast trends. And we try really to translate these trends into real value. Yeah. Um, so most importantly, everybody is talking about new businesses. Also, Katrina talked about new businesses, new products, new channels, or value-added services. And honestly, if you look at the bottom of it, it's the cultural transformation that must take place in these corporations. Also the mid-sized corporation, because one hobby of myself at McKinsey is that sometimes my colleagues laugh at me is I really love the small mid-sized companies where you can move the needle very quickly, you have very fast decision-making processes, and to help them really to become maybe the unicorns or the niche heroes, right? The uh, hidden champions, so to say. And um, these hidden champions, actually, they start not with new business models, but they start to reinventing their core. They think about, hey, guys, how can we reinvent the core? How can we actually make our products better? How can we produce them much better, more intelligent, smarter? The sensors or the technology that uh, Katrina Startups is providing, for example, helps companies to really be smarter, faster, more intelligent, uh, more energy efficient in their production of, in this case, cars, engines for aircrafts, for drones, and so forth. <laughs> yes, I have. I listen carefully. <laughs> Somebody who, uh, who asked me to apply, I have to understand what yeah. you're doing, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but very often, they really, uh, these companies, the large co uh, corporations, they really struggle to reinvent the core. And I tell you why. At least my humble um, opinion is they lack talents. They lack talents. They lack you guys. Right? This is a room full of 230, 250 people. Right? All of 300. All of 300. <laughs> okay, I didn't know the guy sitting next. Okay. Um, look, that's a very serious problem. Because the word agile, to not think about roles, to not think about hierarchy, that's not in their DNA. Right? And everybody's talking about agile. I can't hear it anymore. Everybody's agile. Right? And they confuse it with chaos. It's not chaos. Right? It's not chaos. Agile. Right? And uh, it's a strict way how small self-guiding uh, teams are measured by outputs and performance, and there are self-organizing, organized, high-performing teams. That's, I think, the definition. So, um, but these companies struggle. They have worked decades in different structures. And to really break through, we need you, right? In different roles, and follow your passion, do whatever you like, and I'm with Katrina, and um, to say, look, um, follow your passion. And I followed my passion to say, look, I want to be very close to the clients, really make successful products, and help a little bit the society. Um, just to give you one example, um, where I feel very honored to be part of this uh, exercise, is to help a pharma company to reduce the um, duration of the development cycle of the new medicine, we are talking here about uh, oncology from seven years to two years. Using artificial intelligence, access to mass data, using a new platform that actually combines worldwide more than 10,000 scientists 
and also building a, an ecosystem also together with startups that enables the scientists and the researchers really to move much faster forward than they could in the past. And we're doing that now for three years. And honestly, they're working on one, um, on one lung cancer medicine, uh, medication. And uh, phase zero and phase one, um, and phase one already started. Uh, so phase zero is a preclinical phase, one you enter in the clinical phase. Um, they are pretty successful in really increasing dramatically efficiency and effectiveness and bringing this medication to the market, helping people that suffer from lung cancer. And I tell you what, the strategy is, because what we find out, lung cancer is um, the distribution of uh, lung cancer among mankind is more with the poorer people interested, poorer from a financial perspective, right? And uh, what we try to do together with this pharma company to help them to get access to this medication, which is a super thing. And I feel very honored. These are the things we were doing. What are we doing there? We actually um, designed the concept. We thought about, hey, we worked together. It was very impressive. Um, there was not a crowd like here, 300. There was 50 researchers and scientists. And we thought, hey, how can we make your life better? And um, they uh, told us, hey, help us to increase efficiency and speed of the development uh, of the early drug development. And, um, and early drug discovery, by the way. So, and, and that's what we did. And then we did uh, all these agile meetings, uh, all these customer journeys together with the researchers. And uh, then we, we developed prototypes. We reached out to uh, more than 1,000 startups, we reached out to Silicon Valley, to our Chinese colleagues. And finally, uh, what we did, we started this pilot, we developed this platform, and last but not least, it went live. It's now live for, uh, one year, uh, for two years, sorry. It took one year to really put it live in, uh, in full breath. And uh, we already see the early results. This is what companies do. And I want to emphasize this, they need desperately talents like you. Um, just some you know, figures. I don't want to bother you. These are more financial figures. I tell you one thing that we did for the Welt Hunger Hilfe. Yeah. So um, uh, what we tried to do with them, and uh, it was pretty successful, they left off an efficient system for an effective distribution of nutrition. So you always see these rice stacks that are delivered to countries. Yeah? And uh, in former times it was, the more influence the country has, the louder actually you shout, the more food you get. But it doesn't say that the people are actually suffering, suffering uh, there in this country the most. Therefore, what we try to do is to help them to implement the system, to also anticipate, right, dry periods, to anticipate these things that actually cause uh, this poverty and uh, the hunger in this country, and really have an efficient and effective distribution of food, right? Also based on sensors, uh, we uh, have worked with meteorologists, um, also based on um, human mankind or um, human movements, on refugee streams, and all these kinds are in this model. And uh, we have actually found out that now, hopefully, so that Hilton has given us the feedback, their distribution of, um, of the food is much more effective. I wouldn't say efficient, because efficient is a wrong word in this country. Effective, so giving the food to the people who suffer the most. This is the most important thing, and we help them to do that. Despite all these figures, they are out of our project base, of the project that we have done, and uh, everybody's aspiring it, of our clients, but uh, I can tell you it's pretty tough to get there to these operation efficiencies. And there's one risk in here, right? Everybody of us is asking the question of wondering, hey, how many jobs will be automated in 10 years from now? What should I do in 10 years? Right? So um, I can tell you there's a good and a bad message. 70 to 80% um, of the more operational uh, work and more tasks will be automated in 10 to 15 years from now. Right? There are different companies who say five years, the others say 15 years. I would say five to 10 or 15 years in between, so 10 years is a good thing. But the more cognitive things, the more cognitive tasks, the more intelligent tasks, and the task where you need um, the trial of body, soul, and mind, 
where you need a sound estimation, a sound estimate, how to decide, these jobs will not be automated, right? So therefore, uh, that's the good message. And always when we're talking, especially in Germany, about these figures, um, you automatically have the workers' council around the table, of course, because they say, hey, how do we reskill the people? What do we do? Do we have a concept? <laughs> yes, we try to have a concept, but honestly, sometimes it's very, very difficult. Because um, these employees, right, these people weren't educated, right, with these kind of things. And they have an operational job to do. They cannot take off time after the job and they go home and study three to four hours uh, to understand all these kind of things that's around. So this is a huge, huge effort. Um, I just want to hear one thing that it will definitely change the world to come back to, to what I said. Um, this is a very interesting one. The 2.3 billion users of social media. So, given our uh, population, which is uh, 7.3 billion, I guess, uh, so it's uh, um, diminishing uh, or uh, getting away of 1.5 billion who do not have access to social media, right? We see that more or less 50% of the world population are active social media users. I don't know whether this is a good thing, to be honest. Uh, in the first speech, we heard, um, hey, do we still have control over what we're doing? I think it was massively in German TV, these reports about um, in this one uh, Chinese city where they're giving um, uh, positive points and negative points, depending on how you behave. And they're doing that by really observing it. They have installed in the city of one million people, they have installed more than 20,000 cameras, more than 180,000 sensors. So um, they film you if you cross the street when the traffic light is red. Then you get a negative point. So, and they try to really make it a better world, to reduce crime. Maybe it's a good intent, right? But every, I leave it to you to decide whether this will improve our world or society or not. I have a personal opinion, which I am happy to share after the speech. Um, so let me come to the winners, and this zero says I should be finished. It's okay. It's okay. Good. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> just um, look. This is a, a classic thing, and um, what I really like about that is the company that they thought, "Hey, we are leading like tourism or media or telecoms or banking." are now really suffering by digital because they see the core business model is heavily attacked, right? Just to mention um, crowdfunding mechanisms, right? Just to mention that you see that figure on the lower left hand on the previous slide, um, more than 50% of the payments are actually um, done and operated at outside banks. So um, we have an off-bank payment mechanism Therefore, um, oil and gas and chemicals, and I told you a little bit about pharma, which by the way I recognize is now on its curve. Um, um, they are really heavily investing into digital, into digital technology, compute power, but especially into algorithms and artificial intelligence, right? To anticipate hypotheses, to test these hypotheses, and to make it more effective and efficient for them in customer interaction to learn more about us, especially in energy. I can tell you uh, the four big utilities in Germany, they have uh, much more insights about us than you think. We are supporting one of these utilities in their digital attacker, and it's unbelievable how you can combine unstructured and structured data to find a pattern of one individual. We all heard about this uh, abusive interaction of some eastern, company, uh, eastern countries uh, to the uh, US election, right? And honestly, that is reality. That is reality. Who of you has a Facebook or Instagram account in this room? Raise your hand. Welcome to the new world, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, so I don't, right? Um, and I'll tell you why. I'm pretty happy. I share the things I want to share physically with my friends and my family. And um, just an anecdote, I just coming from a two weeks holiday. 
And uh, what I always do in the holidays, I do digital fasting. So I just switch up everything. We were in Austria in the Alps, hiking, mountain biking, and everything. It was super fun. And when I came back, imagine, nothing changed. So the sun is still rising, the people are still there, they still look the same, right? So, um, and Trump is making all of these jobs. So, nothing changed. So what I really want to ask you is, um, and it's also what we ask our clients, think to cool down a little bit and turn off this always on thing. It's not necessary. Follow your passion. That's also, by the way, what I meant with, uh, hey, our, our clients need a US talents. And do whatever you like, right? Either you would say, hey, I want to go consulting, do consulting, go an internet startup, or go a physical startup hardware, whatever you like, and just do it, yeah? And uh, be careful a little bit with sharing the data. Um, like, just give one or two examples, and then I close of uh, what I really like, how digital is um, implemented, also with the help of sensors and algorithms. This is John Beer, he's, uh, he's a machine company, everybody would think, hey, this is old school, what are they doing? Honestly, they built a complete ecosystem to help farmers end to end, right, to grow their crop. So they have an ecosystem with drones, with sensors, with everything, and by this machine, is helping this farmer um, to, uh, to really harvest, for example, or to check the health of the crop. There are, on this machine, 14 sensors that are checking um, 8 KPIs um, in, the, in the earth, and they are checking 4 KPIs in the crop, and actually they are telling him how many pesticides he should use or not use, and which one. So now guess, what is the reduction of the use of pesticides based on that technology? And by the way, John Deere did that because they said, hey, we want to help the farmer to save money. Yeah? So the official statement, I think, is a different one. Help society, make it a better world, make it a more healthy food. But um, guess, what's the number? Why? <laughs> no, it's 40 percent. 40 percent less pesticides. That's wonderful, and that's how these guys actually uh, have uh, included digital in their whole ecosystem. And they built the tractors and machine at the beginning, yeah. And now uh, they're really helping farmers to um, yeah, to uh, grow healthier nutrition. Last but not least, and I love this one. This. Uh, Kid a bit of a guy. Um, um, on the school, on the new machines, they have 12 sensors. And what they sense is, um, oh wow, it's dropping us, so the air condition, we should definitely close. Um, so what they, what they measure actually is um, the vibrations, the temperature, yeah, the speed, how they can actually advance and remove um, actually, um, or to dig deep into the earth. And uh, they can anticipate when this scoop will break down. So they will provide another machine or another material of the scoop to really keep the construction site going. Yeah. And that's very important, especially for developing countries, where you have very, very small periods where you can build houses, yeah. made of bricks or uh, of uh, cement. And this is uh, super exciting because um, here the, um, the construction period that actually where these machines are required is then reduced meanwhile by 30 to 40 percent. This is wonderful. So um, to close here, um, then we should definitely have the drinks. This is what we somehow see in our clients. What are the nine things that lead somehow to success? And I really say somehow to success because success is not guaranteed. Um, honestly, one very important one is here the last one, running the transformations, and especially the cultural transformations. And never forget, and this uh, should be the last word of, uh, of today here, is the courage for workarounds. 
So taking workarounds if something doesn't work, um, make it work, go another way, and here again for your passion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Great. Let's still go take a couple of questions before we get the drinks. Can you shout? I think it might as, you know, convince you to see the Because also, you know, in, uh, I have a very good friend who studied history, right, and so on. And he said, you cannot imagine, right, how much digital I'm using, right, to do my studies. It's unbelievable in history, right, to do all of this stuff. So I think to understand a little bit digital life cycle, the opportunities that the new technologies are giving to you as an individual. First. Second, don't get overwhelmed by information. We have so many channels that are actually influencing us with information. Really select and focus. You are poor guys. When I was 25, it's meanwhile 22 years ago. Yeah, we had for 20. No, we had already five or nine uh, TV channels. But look, this is massive. You have so many. You have access to so much information that's unbelievable. So focus. Right? And third, and I think this is Generation Y, again, and Generation Z at the border, um, don't forget to party and to have spare time. <laughs> no, honestly, because we were educated work hard to play hard, right? And all this cheap money that has educated us, hey, God, go, go for gold, whatever, honestly, it's stupid. We are we are longer absent and sorry to be so psychological and philosophical. We are longer absent on this earth than we are present, right? So why should we worry the hopefully 80 or 90 years while we're here? So let's do whatever you like to do, focus, and also have a little bit of fun. I know that's a that's an actual title level, but it's Without knowing what you're interested in, it's pretty tough. But I think you need a basic understanding of the opportunities what the digital and technology is giving to you. Without that, I think uh, it's a tough future. Do you have a question over here? Sorry. Uh, you were talking about social media that were somehow against it, and you were also talking about surveillance. Do you have a problem with it? I don't have a problem with social media. Did I say that I don't like social media? No, not at all. It doesn't do um, it. It is good, right? However, the dedicated use of social media is good. You shouldn't post everything to have it. No. That's my personal life, right? However, I think social media is very important. Um, structured and unstructured data are very important. And we are, one, one client of myself is gathering unstructured and structured data about its products and social media, right? And it's definitely mirrored in the product development of the next generation of products. It's wonderful. The customer centricity comes from social media. So therefore, I would rather see it's, a, it's a, not a threat, it's an opportunity. However, we were not educated to use the opportunity. Let me give you let me give you a um, an example. If you walk in here in a fashion store, at the entrance you don't post your ID card, you don't post your bank account, you don't shout in, in the in the fashion store, hey my name is XYZ. Are you doing that? No. Huh. 
if you buy the online fashion store, you do that. And you don't know who hosts the data. Here we are. So therefore, we were not really educated. Uh, you were, right? My generation was not educated to make best use out of social media, out of um, these internet platforms. We had to really think about it, how to really leverage it. Therefore, if you have a focused, restricted use of these social media, I think it's super powerful and it's important. Let's take one last question. Over here, was it? Okay, two short ones. Um, two short ones. What's the fifth largest sports uh, group all about? <laughs> what? Uh, you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. The fifth largest sports club. What yeah. is it all about? What is it all about? We have uh, 15 um, different kinds of sports, from swimming, sailing, diving, basketball, tennis. And it's in Aschaffenburg, it's uh, the last uh, castle in that area. <laughs> no, it's in the Frankfurt actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Do you want to know the name? Because I don't know how to work so okay. it's irrelevant. Okay. And the next one, what's your favorite book of all time? Oh, tough one. <laughs> I have several ones. Three? No, I... Huh? Can you repeat the question? Uh, what's my favorite book? Yeah. Actually, it's a Clausewitz. Wow. <laughs> cloud, a uh, cloud is on strategies. strategies. Could you repeat it, please? Cloud, cloud is a bit on strategies. So, cloud is a bit was actually the, if you will, he has invented Agile. <laughs> Honestly, if you read it and it translate it into today's world, this guy was. He was the uh, beginning of the 19th century. So, um, yeah. And uh, the best strategy, so one sentence of him was the best strategy fails when you first test it. I hope that answers your question. So, any more questions? I don't know. I guess there were less go for beers and other questions. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day.